Good morning, everyone. I don't know why, but as soon as I come to church, every time I come to church, I can't stop laughing and smiling. I think just this loud of blessing coming to me through Box Mount. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming to the worship. Last week, as it was my first Sunday, I actually wanted to dress up a little bit, right? Look nice. But it seems like I overdressed because a couple of you guys came up to me saying, Brian, do you have a short? I said, yes. <laughs> and they say, wear one tomorrow. I mean, next week. Okay, so, Joe, how do I look? Do I look okay? <laughs> Thumbs up, right? There you go. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, last week, I had a brief, like, 30 seconds or less or more of introducing myself. And I said I would let you know about myself. I'd like you to deliver testimony. Uh, and also, I would like to get to know each other. I mean, let's know you guys more. Uh, but here's one thing that I also, I mean, I want you to know. Uh, as a startup, right? Um, my close Christian friends often encourage me to, con- to be confident about myself. And the reason why they kept saying this to me is because I frequently said that I'm not good at this and not, and, or I'm not good at that. And although I didn't feel insecure or lacked confidence, I used to say, uh, used to say that because I wanted to be humble. I just, I, say it, I just said as a sign of humility or to remind myself to work harder because, as, as always, I have tons of rooms to work, right? To grow, to be a better Christian. But there is one thing that I couldn't make better, regardless how hard I work. And guess what? I am not good at telling jokes. <laughs> Even the funniest joke I heard, if I tell it to others, they will instantly say, Brian, don't try. We still love you. We'll still love you. You know, we have experienced the greatest love of God through Christ, but don't try. My friend said, I don't have a sense of humor. I'm not good at telling jokes or funny stories, but I am surely talented at telling dad jokes, right? And they say, everything turns into, into, turns into dad jokes if it's a Brian who tells the funny stories, right? So as a for instance, I would say this kind of joke. I said, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. He said, hey, hungry, I'm dead, right? That's the joke. And I would laugh out for a long time. But my friends don't, right? And they always say, please don't force us to be a dad joke survivor. Don't do it, Brian, to us, right? But however, I never gave up trying because I'm a boxer. So as a boxer... Even if I know I will not win or succeed, I still fight, right? I will still give a shot. I will still try. I mean, still try. And that boxer's instinct activated. And that is what worked, and this is what worked out best in my trial, right? At least in my opinion. Here's my joke that I came up. There was a group of my friends. I would go to them, right? And out of nowhere and randomly, I would tell them, you know, guys, I know Tom Cruise. You guys know Tom Cruise, right? I would tell them I know Tom Cruise. And because my friends know my background, that I've traveled different countries, I speak several languages, they would say, really? Uh, Brian, did you have a chance to be his translator or security detail when he visited Korea to promote his movie? Or what? what is it? Then I would giggle and say, well, actually, he doesn't know me. But I know him because I saw him on TV. <laughs> Ta-da! You know, that's my joke, right? So do you see, guys, where I'm going? It was kind of like my strategy to mention a celebrity that my friends could have seen on TV, only on TV. Then I tell them, I know them, but they don't know me, right? And although I thought it worked well, my friends still said, there we go again, Brian, we love you no matter what. Please, stop trying. (laughs) So even though my tireless effort to develop a sense of humor has gone in vain, I actually learned something very important and something crucial as a Christ follower. It's okay that Tom Cruise doesn't know me. It's okay I know him because I've seen him and heard about him in the media, but he doesn't know me. That's okay because God knows me. That God, who is the creator of the universe and everything in it, he knows me. He knows who I am. He knows where I am. And of course, he knows where I am going. And it's so encouraging, isn't it? The question is, 
how much do we know God as Christ followers? Or how hard do we try to understand Him more in depth? Or know Him better? Or love Him as He tells us to love Him? I mean, God saved us through our faith in Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross and resurrection. He reconciled us to Him. He adopted us into His family. He says we are His children. And He never stopped working, right? He continues sanctifying work on us to be more like His Son, Christ Jesus. And because He's gracious and merciful, He protects us, provides for us, and gives us a desire for His righteousness, which does not let us to lead, uh, lead, which does not lead us to be ignorant about sin and be absent from the brokenness of our world. And of course, He calls us to love Him to love others, and spread the good news to the end of the earth, and so on. We can keep listing why we should seek to know God more and better. So for who God was and He is, and He is to come, it's important that we seek to know Him better as Christ followers. Can I get an amen for that? And this is why I appreciate this sermon series on attributes of God. Pastor Charles went through... um, Six of them, and one of them was on YouTube, so I wasn't present on, uh, on that Sunday at the church, but I listened to it multiple times. It was so encouraging. I, I just want to go briefly go through, right? So this is what we went through. God is eternal. So what? God is everlasting. He has existed in the past and will continue to be in the future. That God who existed yesterday, he exists today, and he will exist tomorrow. So we do not have to be enslaved by the past because God was there. You do not have to fear the future because God is there. You are a new man. You are a new creation. And that God is leading you and guiding you. Next, God is good. So what? God is so good that he is the source of all goodness, right? He is the standard of goodness for Christians, for us. Right? Or for some of us, or many of us, who accepted Christ as our, our Savior. God's goodness is the source of our security. There's nothing we should fear in God. And God is holy. God is morally pure and completely incorruptible. God is, God's holiness sets him apart from humility and all of creation. As a Christ follower... I think when we become Christ followers, right, when we start following Christ Jesus, there is this natural desire that comes up in our hearts that we want to be more like Christ Jesus, right? In our prayers, in the way how we speak, in the way how we live, we rely on the Lord. We want to be more like Christ Jesus. We pray that God would mold us and shape us so that we can be more like Christ Jesus, right? And that God's holiness is the perfect example that we should look up to. Next, God is all present. So what? Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord, your God, who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. If you have made Christ your Lord and Savior, he will never leave you or forsake you. No matter how hard things get, God is there. God will never abandon you. Next, God is all powerful. So what? God can handle any problem or troubles. God resolves our problem. We had a problem that no human, no man could resolve. There was our problem of sin, right? But God saved it. God saved us. God resolves that through his son, Christ Jesus, on the cross. God can do what he promises. God can do greater things than you ever imagine. What God has in his mind, God's will are beyond our imagination or beyond our calculation, or beyond our expectation. And lastly, God is all-knowing. So what? God knows what happened and what is going to happen. If you love him, you have nothing to fear. You can be strong in God. Amen? So, as a continuation of this beautiful sermon series on attributes of God, today we're going to speak about sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, and God's unchangingness. First, God is sovereign. What does that mean? 
The definition says, sovereignty above or superior to all others, chief, greatest, supreme, supreme in power, rank, and authority, holding the position of ruler, royalty, reigning, independent of all others. Psalm 103, 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heaven, and his sovereignty rules over all. Amen. This is who God is. The sovereignty is the godness of God. And this is what it is to be God, right? He's presiding, ruling, and governing over all the affairs of his creation, including ourselves. It means there are no accidents in our life. There are no random occurrences. Because God who is upon the throne in heaven is actively reigning in our life. There is nothing uncontrollable and ungovernable for our sovereign God. Job 42 verse 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none, can, and, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is God who rules. God is God who reigns. He actively reigns and presides over the entirety of his created order. He's not merely and passively sitting on his throne, disconnected from the world. But instead, upon his throne, he's directly governing and ruling over everything related to his creation. So our hearts should be delight that God is the one who is in control over all that comes to pass. Our God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, is ruling and has a master plan and has the macro as well as the micro plans for all of your human history, and including our life. Even the smallest thing does not happen just like that. God has a will. God has a purpose. God has a, uh, God has a meaning in it. And I guess it's our responsibility to seek and to find it. And no one and nothing can stop God too. You know, no one can stop God doing what pleases him. He will accomplish his will no matter what, in his time, in his way. And God's sovereignty is a natural consequence of his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, right? All-knowing, all all-powerful, all-present. All-knowing, all-present, all-powerful. God is actively involved in our life. Amen? So, but here's my question. Have you ever asked God why something is happening to you, especially the difficulties or disaster or problems or problematic situations? I mean, I'm not saying you may have asked God in a rebelling, blaming, or resentful tone, but you ask God in your prayers because you're curious. We want to know God's will, right? I have a few, and I would like to share a little bit about them. This is me. I was born 41 years ago to a wonderful family. It's my father and mother when they brought me home three days after I was born. And on the left, that's me, who pretended like a king or a prince, right? My father was running a small business, and we are financially stable, and he was a loving father, and my mother, a caring mother, she always expressed her respect to father for all that he does. And my father never stopped expressing his love towards my mom. So seeing them, I always knew, oh, they're not going anywhere, right? This is a beautiful family. It's a good one family. I love it. Well, we didn't worship God. We didn't know Christ Jesus. We were not in relationship with Jesus. When I was seven years old, there was a PTA meeting, Parents Teacher Association meeting at school. I was going to this elementary school in our district. And our classroom teacher was a Christian all her life. And after the meeting, she happened to have a conversation with my parents, and she invited us to the church. And that's how our journey as Christ followers began. 
And I was happy as, as a little kid. And my parents were too. You know why? I mean, we were happy. We we're all set, right? We we're financially stable. We, don't, we have a good relationship. No problems. Everyone's healthy. But two years after we became Christians, or we started going to church, my father was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. We tried to do everything we could. In fact, we actually did all we could do. But he didn't stay with us more than three months after he was diagnosed. I don't even remember the stage, but it was bad. You know, my father is an athlete. He trained boxing all his life. He was a hunter. He was an athlete. He always took me out for trainings. He loved camping. But I saw him shrinking little in the literal sense, right, losing his muscles. I remember the last thing he told me. I didn't know back then, but I think he loved God so much and he was saved. I was, at least I want to believe that, right? Because he told me this. Hey, Brian, I want you to remember three things. First, honor the God. Surrender yourself to him and love him, obey him first. Second, love your wife and children as God grants your family, just like I try to do, just like your mom did. And third, be a conduit of God's blessing to us. It was the most, one of the most devastating moments or seasons for me and for my mother. I remember my mother had to start working right after my father was buried. And she worked from Monday through thir- uh, Saturday from 5 a.m. until 6 p.m. Yet she woke up extra early so she could spend one hour for praying. And I would wake up hearing her praying kind of loud. It's kind of customary in Korean Christianity, right? Lord, Lord, help me. We need you. I love you. Right? And I saw it. But I still did not understand, Lord, why this is happening. It wasn't good. Everything was good, right? I had a father, mother, home, dogs, car. I barely see my mother. And I realized there are some questions you can ask God, but it takes years for you to understand his great will. Time went on. The Lord called us to be a missionary family to Russia. My mother started going to a short-term, go on a short-term uh, mission trip to Japan, to China. And this time she wanted to, uh, she decided to go to Russia, and she also decided to take me together. We literally spent about 10 days, when, but when we came back to Korea, although we spent only 10 days, but whenever we asked, hey, how was your mission trip to Russia? I, we spoke to everyone as if we lived in Russia for 20 years. Oh, this was great. That was beautiful. There are so many places that missionaries need to go and plant a church. We prayed about a year. God finally assured us that he called us to be a missionary family. We went to Russia. Three months after I arrived in Russia, I had to be apart from, I mean, leave my mother, going to a different city. Because my mother's mission strategy was traveling 20 days towards the Siberia from Moscow and tra- taking train back to Moscow in 20 days and evangelizing people in the train. Back then, people did not have internet, smartphones. All they do is using drugs or drinking or playing cards, right? But the good thing is they cannot go anywhere. They cannot go in here, right? So she would come up to them. She knew only a few words. It's amazing to see her preaching in, in Russian for 40 minutes or an hour these days, right? But back then she knew, my name is Esther Lee. I'm from South Korea. I'm a missionary. I love God. And here's a message. In five sentences, God loves you, but there's a problem with sin. You need a Christ. You have to accept him. God has a great plan for you. Boom, that's it. And I'm going to make it short. And I'm hoping that there will be other time that I can share a little more detail if you guys are interested how God has been leading me, right? Not to show up how I live, right? But how God is gracious and merciful and he's faithful in love and his grace. I never seen my mother after we got part, I mean, separated for about two years. And we, in fact, never lived together to these days. She does her missions in Ukraine. 
I traveled 43 different countries. I was in South Korean Army. I ended up being in Philadelphia, and God brought me to Bucksmouth. What a blessing, right? It's beautiful. It's great. Woo! It's one of the best things that happened to me. Ever since my mother got a cell phone or a smartphone, to be exact, we actually have a frequent conversation over the phone. 10, 15 minutes every day or every other day. And what we do, we pray. Some days I have a day off when she doesn't have more time. We would just pray hourly over the phone. That's what we do. We pray for each other. We pray for America. We pray for Korea. We pray for all the nations. We pray for Box Mount. And in one of those conversations, my mother said, Hey, Brian, after all these years, when we had a lot of questions, why your dad passed away that early? Why, do we have to, why did we have to go to Russia? And why did we have to be separated? And why we never got together again, which was tough and difficult. Here's what I learned. And she said, what we attempt to call a hardship and disaster can actually be the first painful stage of a blessing of God in our journey following Christ. And in our lives, we have experienced that, Brian, right? We, we, we literally experienced that, son. And there have been many challenges, but needless to say, God of love and grace has led us through all of them to the wonderful place we are in today. Because we are serving God. All of those difficulties and problems only drew us closer to God. Not speaking of that we are missionaries, I'm serving as a pastor, and I love what I'm doing, but I'm not always good at it. I love it. I forgot. Sorry, I'm still messing up with this PowerPoint. This is, this is some pictures, only two of them. It's the school that I went to in Russia and the church I went to. And God has given me great opportunities to See who it is to experience how gracious, merciful, and faithful in loving he is. So after this conversation with mother, we came to a conclusion. God is in control. God is in control of absolutely everything. Amen. That is what we're talking about when it comes to sovereignty of God. God is a sovereign, and his divine control is over everything that happens to you. Even though it does not make sense to you, it happens because God has a plan for it. Amen? God has a will for it. There is a reason why this is happening. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to, a, to the ground apart from your father? Psalm 115, 3. Our God is the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Psalm 121, Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We as Christians should be humbled and grateful for God because he navigates our lives for his will and purpose. And that sovereign God always protects you, he leads you, and guides you at anywhere you are. God is sovereign, so what? Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Our Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Amen. God's sovereignty is a huge source of our comfort. No matter how chaotic or disastrous any situation is in your life, you should not fear because God is still in charge. God is still working. God is still in control. Can I get an amen for that? God is a sovereign in his creation. There's nothing outside the control of his loving and divine plan. Amen? Amen? So as we spoke about the, um, the God's sovereignty, it's easy for us to continue to speak about God's unchangingness, right? What's the dictionary say? What, what does that mean? The, immu in, in, in the immutability of God, right? It's the state or condition of not changing or being unchangeable. Malachi 33, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. Psalm 102, 26 through 27. They will perish, but you remain. 
They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will uh, change them, and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. It's very interesting. Malachi 3, 6. Here God affirms that he is the Lord who does not change. He himself calls himself. He calls himself, I'm the Lord who does not change. What can be more truthful, trustworthy? So the unchangingness, the immutability of God, which is a theological term, means that God is unchangeable in his character and in all of his ways. In other words, God is fixed in who he is. He's unalterable. That it's impossible for God to increase or decrease in his power, knowledge, wisdom, goodness, love, mercy, and fulfilling his promises. God does not change. God is never changing. His attributes are the same from before the beginning of the time into eternity. His character never changes. He's never, he never gets better or worse. There's no ups and downs in his condition. His plans do not change. His promises do not change. So God is the God who was and who is and who is to come. And as, as God is unchanging, whoever is in Christ Jesus should be firmly rooted and grounded in this truth. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not human that he should, should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? It again affirms, confirms that God is changeless from age to age. What does that mean? The God that you knew as a child is the same God who gave you strength in your teenage years. Or if you accepted Christ or Jesus as a Savior, if you met God when you grow a little older, it's the same God that sh- who gave you the wisdom, faith, and understanding. He's the God who was with you in your older years. He's the God when you went to college or got a first job. He's the God when you had a family, when you have your children born. And he's the same God that you will stand before one day in heaven. Can I get an amen for that? We're talking about the very same God. So unchangingness of God. God is unchanging. How, can we, how else we can say? According to the Webster, God is trustworthy. Trustworthy means assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of, worthy of, trust, or confidence. In one word, dependable. If we say God is unchanging, God is immutable, it means he's trustworthy because he's dependable. Why? Because God is our rock. Psalm 18.2, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Isaiah 26 verse 4, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is a rock eternal. Amen. The fact that God is unchanging should be an encouragement to each one of us, Christ followers. We can literally enjoy this incredible joy and truth. Because every time we seek God's grace, he's the same. He's there. He's not going anywhere. He's, because he's Reliable. He's trustworthy. And one other thing I want us to know about God is that he does not have a bad mood. He's not mood swings, right? He's not easy day or difficult days. He's not different God yesterday and today. It's like he's a lesser God or a greater God today. No. Every time we turn to the Lord, he is rock. He is refuge. He is a fortress. He's ever the same. Thus, God is trustworthy. Amen? So God never changes. God is dependable. Because God never changes, 
and he's dependable. His purposes are, purposes are unfailing. And his promises are unassailable. Because God who promised the eternal life is immutable, we may rest assured and secure, knowing that nothing, like not trouble, no trouble, no hardship, no persecution, famine, shame, danger, or even devil itself shall separate us from the Lord, our God. So God is unchanging. God is immutable. So what? God is dependable and trustworthy. God is changeless age to age. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Our trust in him should be confident because we know that he will not indeed and cannot change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So, you know God. You've been learning about God. You've been following the Lord. And the more we get to know God and his will, we should get more confident. We should be more bold, bold and share the joy of living salvation or with salvation or as a saved one through faith in Christ Jesus. I know in the beginning of this this new year, Pastor Charles shared this list with you. And to me, it's like action item. And that's the term I learned from Pastor Charles as I was working with him in the Missio Seminary, right? We have a meeting, we have agendas, and we have action items. We learn who God is. We learn from the church, from pastor, from each other, from the Bible, the biblical teaching. And it's great. You should reach out to your neighbors, ask them how they are doing, right? And you're not peripherally asking, hey, how's it going, right? You, you ask him like a real meaning. And do a kind deed for them. Pray with them. Talk to them about Jesus. Let them know you are a Christian where you go to church and invite them to the church. Today I want to mention this. We might need just a little more extra awareness about our neighbors, right? Because that little extra awareness, who they are, what, what is it that they might be in need of, it would have helped us to reach out to them. And one more thing, last. I just literally print this out, put on my door. And I also put that on the refrigerator. And every time I would go up in the refrigerator to get some food or the ingredients, or every time I would just leave apartment to head out somewhere, I would just read it at least once. Because it will keep reminding us that we should reach out to those who need Christ, who need a Savior. And I know it might be difficult and hard, but what I share about my mother today, who did not spoke the language, who was a, all, her by, all by herself, traveling 40 days back and forth from Moscow to Siberia with the two big packages of Bible. Not that my mother is a famous person or anything like that, but if she could do it, you can do it, and I can do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I planted upon waters, and God gave the growth. We just have to plant the little seed in people's hearts, and God will make it grow. Let's pray. The Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we thank you for this time of sharing um, your word. Lord, we just continuously want to remind ourselves how great you are, Lord. God, you are sovereign, uh, means you are actively involved in our lives. You are the governor, you are the ruler, and you would never leave us behind. The fact that you are a sovereign God is, gives us a lot of comfort. Let us not fear anything, even in the most chaotic or the difficult moments of our lives, Lord, as we face different challenges, because we know that you are God who is in control, who is working. And even though we may have uh, some questions, Lord, you will let us understand when time comes, Lord, and you will bring us to the good faith 
So we continue to control ourselves to you, loving you, loving neighbors, and spreading the good news to others around us. And also, Lord, we want to remember that you are unchanging God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let us remember that we can feel so secure in you. And also give us more encouragement, Lord, and boldness so that we can reach out to those who need to hear you, who need to hear about you, who need to be in the relationship with you, Lord. Father, we want to give you all glory to you and praise and honor. Thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.